So I want you to welcome our long distance crowd from all over the world and let's make them welcome tuning in our broadcast right now around the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. We love you. We're glad you're here and watching our broadcast today. I'm reading my text from Acts chapter number 27 and verse number 29. Then fearing lest we should have fallen upon rocks, they cast four anchors out of the stern and wished for the day. And as the shipmen were about to flee out of the ship, when they had let down the boat into the sea, under the color as though they had cast anchors out of the foreship, Paul said to the centurion and to the soldiers, except these abide in the ship, you cannot be saved. Then the soldiers cut off the ropes of the boat and let her fall off. What is happening in our text is the Apostle Paul is going through a great storm on the Mediterranean Sea. They're headed for Rome, and the Holy Ghost warned Paul before they ever left. He was a prisoner headed to Rome to face Nero and the chopping block. Paul warned a centurion that a storm was coming, and the Holy Ghost told him that it would bring great damage to the ship. But they despised Paul and rejected his warning and took out across the Mediterranean Sea, headed northwest. When they got out in the middle of the sea for 14 days, they never saw the sun or the stars, which was their compass back in those days. They had lost all sense of direction, and now it was out of control. They had thrown the lading or all the storage of the ship. They had thrown it all overboard because the foamy waves were about to put them in a watery grave. Everybody had lost all hope. The shipmen had thrown over the four anchors because they felt like they were about to run into some rocks. And they threw the anchors down to try to hold this ship in place. But in doing so, there was a lifeboat. And some of the soldiers got together and let the boat down as if they were casting anchors. And they did it under disguise and they were going to crawl in the boat and let everybody else die in the water. Paul saw what they were doing. He had been shut up with the Holy Ghost and the angels of God. And Paul came out and said, anybody that leaves this boat, you're going to die. So the soldiers had come to a point where they either had to do what they felt like they could do within themselves to preserve their life, or they were going to have to listen to the man of God and let go of the ropes that were leading down to the lifeboat. And the Bible said they cut the ropes and watched them fall into the foamy sea that night. I wonder what went through their mind as their blades slithered through those four ropes and they watched that white rope disappear into the darkened ocean. No doubt they turned and said to each other, we can officially say we are at the end of our rope. Now, we're not on a boat this morning, and we're not sailing in the Mediterranean Sea. But there are going to be times when all of us feel like we have come to the end of our rope. This terminology comes from an illustration of an, angel, of an animal being tied to a tree by a rope with a leash around its neck. And once the animal has extended the rope, he has reached what we call the end of of its rope. You can come to the end of your rope, it limits you in your patience. It limits you in your frustration, your agony. You're no longer to cope with what you're facing today. The best definition I found of coming to the end of your rope is reaching the point where you're running out of options in life, where it seems like no help is available and all of your physical strength is now gone. Whether we like it or not, there are coming times and events in all of our lives where answers and remedies to our problems seem like an eternity away. Frustration combined with exhaustion can lead any of us to conclude that help and hope has vanished forever. The accumulation of multiple situations at one time seems to have the ability to drain us of all of our faith and stability very quickly. The agonizing truth about coming to the end of our rope is the fact that many times 
we're not even at the end of our rope because of our own personal problems, but it's because of issues from people that we love and care about. But the Bible declares that the Lord is our comfort and our strength. Even in the times of weakness and doubt, God has sustained you, preserved you, and carried you when you were not even aware of it, I'm sure. If you're at the end of your rope today, and if you've never been there, hang on, because life will put you there. You are going to come to this conclusion some period of time in your life. One man said this, when you come to the end of your rope, just tie a knot, hang on, and cry out to God, for he will and can show up right on time. So I begin to trace through the Bible, and I found the most exhibited times when people of God felt like they were at the end of their rope. When America sells $11 billion in antidepressants in 12 months, almost a billion dollars a month, somebody's at the end of their rope. When psychologist offices, they're lined up out the door like a food bank, somebody is at the end of their rope. When suicide and body mutilation and cutting yourself is at an all-time high, somebody is at the end of their rope. When beer joints are filled to overflowing and dope pushers can't get drugs fast enough for the demands, I promise you that society's screaming they're at the end of their rope. But you don't have to be lost and you don't have to be in a godless society to get to this point in your life. I wish I could tell you that when you get saved, everything's a bed of roses and it's all going to be bright and beautiful and calm, but that's not the reality of the Bible. One fellow said, I was going through a dark tunnel, and he said, somebody said to me, there's a light at the end of your tunnel. He said, yeah, and I bet it's a train. There are times when you think it'll never get better than what it is. We have people here right now as a pastor, multiple people, good people, sitting in this building right now that feel like they're hanging on by a thread or just a hair. But they're hanging on. And they're here today. And they didn't feel like coming. And they didn't want to come. And they could have given 10 excuses why they didn't come. But that one thread got them up out of bed when they didn't want to and got them in the shower when they didn't want to and got them dressed when they didn't want to and got them in the car when they didn't want to and got them in the parking lot when they didn't want to and got them in the church when they didn't want to and they're sitting here today hanging by a thread but I got good news for you you may be at the end of your rope but there's still hope at the end of your rope God can and will minister to you when you feel like you've reached the end. Allow me to give you some biblical examples and I will be through. Number one, sometimes when you're at the end of your rope, you feel like you just want to give up and quit. And I don't say that nonchalant, and I'm not talking about somebody that gets up every Monday wanting to quit on God, but sometimes the storms can get so wild that you don't even know what direction you're in. You feel like it's a skillet spinning in the air, and you can't get a handle on it, and it's just wild and crazy. And I was reading, and I saw something I'd never seen before. I was reading Matthew 8, where the disciples were going through the storm with Jesus, and it was out of hand, and they didn't know what direction they were going in, and, and man, they thought they were dying. And they, as a matter of fact, they didn't give up. they give up that it was never going to change. And I'll tell you how I know it. The only people on the boat were the disciples and Jesus. Jesus, the Bible says, in the basement of the boat asleep. The storms are raging. And the disciples run into the bottom of the ship and said, Lord, you don't even care that we're perishing. Now, I got a question. If the disciples are down in the basement of the ship talking to Jesus, who's driving the boat? That thing was so out of hand that nobody had even tried to take the rudder and steer it anymore. And that's all Jesus was waiting on, by the way, was for them to let go. 
You say, this storm's so messed up, if I let go, it'll go crazy. You may find help that way that you won't find any other way just by letting go, finding out, finding out where Jesus is, letting go of it. They had literally given up, and they went down in the basement of the boat, and the interesting thing about it, Jesus is asleep. Now, they're chewing Rolaids, drinking Maalox under psychiatric care on Facebook. And Jesus said, he's not the least bit concerned. And they rolled him over and said, we've perished. We're giving up. It's over. We're dying. And you're sleeping. And Jesus rolled over and said, oh, ye of little faith, get out of my way. I told you we're going to the other side. Bless God, if the boat sinks, I'll turn it into a submarine because you can bank on my word. If I said we're going to the other side, doesn't matter what you feel like, doesn't matter what you look like, doesn't matter how hopeless it is, if you got the word of God on it, you can settle down. It'll be all right. Now watch this. Now, I may be wrong here, brother guy, but I've never seen this before. So Jesus gets up. The winds are blowing. The sea's coming in. It looks like an ocean of water. Dark clouds, no sun, no stars, no nothing. Trees are falling over on the banks. Birds are running, trying to find a place to hide. And Jesus steps out on the bow of the boat and says three words. Peace, be still. And the Bible says that the water laid down like a sheet of glass. The dark clouds rolled away like a scroll. The birds started singing amazing grace over the boat. And the trees were waving hallelujah over on the other side. But this is, this is what I've never seen before. Brother Durham, it's a question. When Jesus said, peace be still, was he talking to the water? Or was he talking to 12 that was ready to give up? I think when it comes to the accumulation of the world that he created by the word of his power, I don't think Jesus has to say anything. He went up to a colt's ass one time that nobody had ever sat on, and without saying a word, Jesus got on it, and that thing never flinched. The creation bows to him. They know who he is. When they were going through that storm, when Jesus stepped up on the bow, he didn't have to say anything. One wave looked at the other and said, I know who that is. He walked on my daddy one time. He... <laughs> and the wind said yeah I know who he is uh, he came down for Elijah in a whirlwind one time when Jesus said peace be still he wasn't speaking to them when he stood on the boat they all sat down and saluted the son of God but he was looking at his children that were at the end of their rope and he was saying to them when you're at the end of your rope and your life is out of control, and you feel like quitting. Peace be still. There's hope when you feel like quitting. When you find yourself wanting to give up, hang on, there's hope. Number two, there's hope at the end of the rope. Not only when you find yourself wanting to quit, but there's hope when your family goes crazy. I'm telling you, man, I've been doing this 40 years. I've learned one thing. America is a nut house being run by the inmates. That's what we're living in. Families are crazy. People are crazy. Sometimes I don't think I'm a pastor. I'm a referee. I'm going to trade my Bible in for a whistle, get rid of my suits, start wearing black and white striped shirts and tennis shoes. By the way, that's a joke, bless God. That ain't happening as long as I'm here. But sometimes your family can be so out of whack. I've probably got six or seven families. I'm talking about good people now, godly people sitting in this building that has come to me and said, my family is driving me crazy. You, you know, you remember when we were kids, we'd have family reunions or we'd get together on Saturday and sit on the porch. You can't even do that anymore because there's some lizard tongue drama queen that's got to bring up something from 40 years ago 
but it didn't happen that way anyhow. Bless God, you can't have a, you can't have a bowl of banana pudding without some idiot getting stupid. And the only reason why you're not laughing is because you're the idiot that gets stupid at your family. Because you know I'm telling it right. And your family can drive you nuts. Your mate can drive you crazy. Men are weird. You girls that are dating these boys, you better get a good look at him because you're seeing him at his best. You think he's like that after you marry him? You ought to sue your brain for non-support. He's an idiot. You're going to find out he's an idiot. And boys, that good-looking girl you're dating, she is a bundle of nerves waiting for an opportunity to explode. They go through the change of life from the first breath to their pronounced dead. Women are always in the change of life. Every day you wake up, which wife have I got today? Come on, Brother Randy, you can shout. You're the one who told me to say it, so back me up when I say it. Your kids can drive you crazy. Man, you raise them and try to put something in them and they just go nuts. To some of our kids, your parents can drive you crazy. I remember when I got saved, it used to be the parents going to the altar praying for kids. But in this church, it's kids come to the altar praying for their parents. And your family can drive you crazy sometimes. You think, man, I'm just at the end of my rope. And I remember over in the land of the Gadareans, there was a man living in the tombs. And the Bible said he had 6,000 demons in him. And he ran naked in a cemetery. And in the land of the Gadareans, they had to build the cemeteries up on the hills because the floodwaters would come in from the Sea of Galilee and wash their, their dwellings away. So they built the cemeteries up on top of the hill. And the Bible declares there was a crazy man living up there. And the Bible said he wore no clothes because only crazy people go around naked. You say, well, I go around half naked. Well, you half crazy then. And the Bible said he was beyond hope. He was beyond help. But you got to remember, brother guy, that's somebody's son. That's somebody's boy up there. That's somebody's grandson. There's pictures in their home of him sitting on their lap when he was a little boy. They remembered when he learned how to walk. They remembered when he started school. They remembered when he graduated. Now he's a demon-possessed vagabond living in a cemetery. And the Bible said he had broken feathers and chains and would take rocks. He's practicing body mutilation. He's foaming at the mouth. There's thousand demons in him. And his family would look up at night with the full moon behind that mountain. Tombstones are stretching up in the air. And they'd look at their son and say, what a mess. And when they would go through the community, everybody at Walmart or the grocery store would say, you know, your boy, he'll never change. He's so far gone, naked, cutting himself. He's broke out from jail. He's got fetters and chains hanging on him. He's foaming at the mouth. Long shaggy hair and untrimmed beard. Foam running down in his beard. He's wild eyed. He's bloodshot. And he's crying and dancing among tombstones. And that's my son. That's him. And I'll be honest, I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know what I'm going to do with my son. Have you got a kid that's got you at the end of your rope? But all the time, they were yelling, no hope. There was a little boat coming across 12 miles away from the Sea of Galilee. And all the time, they were saying, no hope. Help was on the way. And when that little boat pulled up on that seashore and the gangplank fell down and the Son of God walked out, that wild man come running out of the mountains and they fell at the feet of Jesus and the next time you see him he's clothed and it is right in mind and when mom and dad were at the end of the rope Jesus gave hope when your family goes crazy number three when your finances come up short people are struggling Financially, sometimes it's hard to make ends meet. We have elderly people here, good people, godly people. Some of them have to decide every month, do I buy groceries or do I pay my electric bill? 
sitting right here in this building. And if they're members and we find out, of course, we, our leadership team knows we help them. We should help them. That's the way it's supposed to be. But it bugs the fire out of me that we give illegal aliens $2,600 a month and give our old people $1,200 a month. That bothers the living fire out of me. And if AOC don't lie to she can pack her freaking clothes and leave this country anytime she wants, I say we ought to take care of our people first. That's the way it's supposed to be. That's the way it ought to be. And here, that's the way it's going to be. And there have been times I wondered if God was going to take care of me. My wife is sitting here. There's times we put our last dollar in the gas tank. No checking account, no credit cards, nothing. And when God called me to preach, I was sitting in the restaurant with my aunt and uncle at Wama to the Lord. And my wife was sitting there with me. And uh, we just got married. I'm 19 years old, and I'm called to preach. And God began to deal with me about going to Bible college and seminary. And at my aunt and uncle that wanted me to Jesus, you understand, they've been down the road with the Lord a long time. And we were sitting there at the restaurant, and I said, but Uncle Buford, i got to take care of my family. And I'm, i got a good job, and I, you know, I own a trucking company. And a truck repair and I, I'm buying a funeral home and I, I mean I got money and I got everything I need and he said Phil the bottom line is it's either greed or God and this is what I said I said but Uncle Buford you act like I could just step out on nothing and God just lets money fall out of the clouds I said money just don't f come from nowhere I got to make a living this is the God's truth my wife was sitting there a woman come up to my table and she stood there with tears flowing down her face Never seen her in my life. I said, lady, can I help you? She said, no, sir. She said, I'm sitting over on the other side of the restaurant with my two little kids. And she said, sir, I'm about to do the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. I said, well, well what is it, honey? She said, I was sitting over there eating with my kids. And God told me to come over here and give you some money. Does that mean anything? Is that the way it happened, Miss Kid? Is that exactly how it happened? I'll be honest, I didn't appreciate that because I was too busy enjoying my doubt and my limitations. I enjoyed being at the end of my rope. And brother, a little woman with two kids by herself slipped money in my hand and she walked away. The Holy Ghost said, yeah, bless God, I can make it rain from heaven. I can bring it out of the cloud. I can bring it out of the water. And 42 years later, I want to say to you, God has been good. God has been faithful. God miraculously has supplied every need that I've ever had. I say when you're at the end of your rope, hang on. There is a God that can supernaturally take care of you. 1 Kings 17, Elijah goes up to an old woman. She's got a little boy. Elijah said, who are you? She said, I'm a widow, and I don't have anything. I'm gathering some sticks. I got one handful of meal and a couple of drops of oil. And said, I'm going to make a cake, and me and my son's going to die. We have no welfare. Obamacare wasn't invented yet. And she said, government won't give me a phone or anything. If you guys don't start amen to me, I'm going to bog down a little bit right there. And she said, I got, enough, I got enough meal to make one cake and a couple of drops of oil to put on it. And I'm broke. I'm telling you, I'm broke. I have nothing. And Elijah said, I'll tell you what don't you do. Cook that cake and give it to me. And I'll tell you something. I love Jesus. But you touch my food, I'll beat the living devil out of you. Now, I'm going to tell you what. You can steal my car and you can shoot my dog and I can forgive you. You touch my groceries, it is on, brother. It is on. You touch my food, you'll see Jesus. Now, here's a little boy. Here's a little boy standing next to his mom. He knows that's all they've got. And here this preacher says, give it to me. If I was that kid, I was thinking, hey, Bubba, if you got that much faith, won't you give it to us? And the Bible says she went in the kitchen. I wonder what it felt like when she put her hand in that barrel and her fingernails scratched the bottom. And she said, Brother Hill, this is it. I wonder what it felt like, Miss Manus, when she took that oil and got that last drop and said, that, 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 that's it. I'm at the end of my rope. She made a cake and she gave it to the preacher and said, that's, 
All I got, I'm at the end of my rope. I'm, I will just die. He said, go back to the kitchen. Get you something to eat. He said, ha, 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 that's funny. You sitting there eating a the cake, telling me to go back in the kitchen. But I'll do what you say. Oh, I wish I had on video. When she reached her hand down in that barrel, and Mill was about that deep in her elbow. And she went to the cruise. And all through the famine, the Bible said, the barrel never went empty, and the cruise oil never went empty. You say, what are you saying? I'm saying, when you're at the end of your rope, God can take care of you. That's what I'm trying to say. I want to close with this last one. There's much more, but I'm done. When you feel unworthy, and I never say this anymore, and I, it's, it's a good thing, but I never say this at a church or anywhere I go that I don't think of Mom Blair. She always comes to my mind in a good way. Brother Charles wasn't saved yet. Miss Blair, somebody invited her brother and uh, Adam, and she'd come a couple of times, and I was standing right here, and she walked over me, tears just absolutely streaming down her face. She said, I've never been in a place like this before in my life, but... Uh, this will be my last service. I won't be back. I said, why would you say you've never been to a church like this, but you're not coming back? She said, because I'm not worthy. <laughs> Man, that broke me. I said, what? She said, preacher, I'm, I'm not worthy to be here. You remember that day, Miss Case? And I put my arm around my case. I said, you listen to me very carefully. None of us are here because we're worthy. We're here because he's worthy. It's got nothing to do with us. We should all be in hell. When the low-down devil brings you to the end of the rope, you just remember, you're not here because you deserve it. You're here because he's worthy. <laughs> Much more I could say, but I gotta close, I'm out of time. A little girl came home from school one day she was eight years old. And sometimes kids say stuff they just shouldn't say. It's just part of being a kid. And one of the kids in the class found out that she was adopted. So some of the kids got together at school, and when they were out in the playground, they started laughing at her and saying, Ha, ha, you're adopted. Your mom and dad didn't even want you. They gave you away. You're adopted. Somebody else is raising you. And she broke down crying and said, Daddy, but I'll always be adopted. They were their mom and dad, and you guys adopted me, and now they're making fun of me. And that daddy full of wisdom reached over and got that little eight-year-old blonde-haired girl and put her up in his lap, brushed the curls back over her shoulders and said, Honey, that's nothing to cry about. Every one of those kids that are making fun of you, their parents had to take what they got. But we chose you. We walked by you. We didn't have to love you. We didn't have to take you in. We didn't have to give you our name. We didn't have to raise you. We could have went right on our way. You remember when they say that, their parents had to take them just as it was. But we found favor with you, and we passed by you, and we brought you into our family. Let me tell you something. When the low-down devil tells you you're not worthy to be in his family. You remind him God could have walked right by us, but he chose us. He loved us. Yes! God put us in his family and chose us. Hallelujah. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. of Elijah declaring the word of the Lord and these are the days of your servant Moses righteousness being restored and though these are days of great trial of famine and darkness and sore still we are the voice in the Prepare.